Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Portswood Church. It's really lovely to welcome you today, whether you're joining us from home, uh, watching in the forecourt at church, or whether you're just joining us later on, it's really good that we can gather together to worship God. I'm Jorinda, and I'll be leading you through the service today. And later on, we'll be hearing from Louise, who will be looking at Hebrews 7. But first, we are going to have some family news from Louise. And I know that we had had a really fun time on our bank holiday Monday. There's a little clue just here on where we went. Can you guess where we went on that Monday? Hmm, we went to the beach. <laughs> and I'm sure lots of you would have got up to lots of fun stuff. So let's just see. What has everyone got up to this half term? Hello, Louise. 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 I can't find Louise anywhere. But that doesn't matter. Uh, my name's Andrew and I'm part of the leadership team too, along with Louise and Alice and Peter. And all of us are part of that leadership. So for church stuff, you need to contact someone, contact any one of us. Uh, I can do all that. So I'll do the family news uh, today as Louise isn't here to do it. So as Jorinda says, it's been half term, been lots going on with families. So there's quite a lot to, to see what the families have been up to. Uh, so let's get started then. So who are we first up? We've got Annabelle and Anastasia looking a little bit nervous of those waves coming in. That looks a lovely scene to see there. Carrying on, there's Will and Emily. Will and Emily finally made it out to Guernsey to see their grandparents fishing chips on the beach. Now that's nice, isn't it? And that sunshine, look, glorious. Carrying on, Lizzie's been catching her own food. She's been catching crabs. Well done. And there's Louise. Louise has been camping with her family and with Jeff and Sarah and Bethany, enjoying the outdoors there. That's wonderful to see. Carrying on. Oh, Benjamin and Joshua, they have been enjoying a visit from their grandparents down from Scotland, having a meal in the garden there. And of course, meeting up with family, that's such a thing for us at this such a long period. And as a church family, we want to be meeting up. And I'll talk about that in a minute, the opportunity we've got for that today. Carrying on, Sophie seeing family she hasn't seen for a whole year. Again, on the beach, there's definitely a theme, Jorinda's right there. And then we've got Joshua and Bethany uh, on a very green spot on the Black Mountains. Been doing a bit of walking, I imagine, uh, enjoying that. And then we've got Seth and Isaac. And I think Isaac's hiding in the woods somewhere. If you can see him, take a chance, see if you can find him. So they've been enjoying the outdoors as well. Then, what's this? This is Christmas. This can't be the right photo. This is... Daniel and Sophia enjoying Christmas with their grandparents in June. They really have been catching up, haven't they? They've been catching up on the, on the actual celebration of Christmas right now to celebrate that with family. Isn't that wonderful? Well, happy Christmas to you, Daniel and Sophia and family. That's great to see. But it's not just the families and small children that have been having fun this week. We know there's been a few tea parties going on with some of our older members. And I uh, happen to know that um, uh, Peter and Margaret have been here for a tea party. I didn't take a picture. But also Iris has been having a few tea parties. And we did manage to capture a picture of one of these with Angela. So there's Angela visiting um, to Iris and Ruth and Joy. Doesn't that look wonderful? Um, before, um, before Angela sets off to, to the Middle East. So that's great to see. And so we do love to see all ages of our community. It's wonderful to see that. So do share stuff with you if you've got news. We love to just help each other, get to see each other and see what's going on. And particularly today, after the service, we're having a picnic on the common. Now there's over, over about 70 plus people already signed up. So we're gonna be in three completely separate locations on the common. Um, so we're less than 30 in those locations, but there is therefore capacity for more people to come along. So please do be a part of this community. Come along and join us. Um, contact somebody at the email address or, or just ring somebody and say, I'd like to join you. 
and they can direct you where to come. But we want to be family together. We want to meet up. We want to enjoy uh, this fine weather and this opportunity we've got. So please do come and come along to that. It's a real great time to be outdoors together. Obviously continuing at church, we continue to be outdoors. And as we move into this month, we'll continue to do more stuff inside as well. So increasing opportunities to come together, be family, to celebrate together. So that's uh, uh, to leave that. Um, and now I hand back over to Jorinda. It's lovely to hear what you all have been up to this past half term. And now we're going to continue our fellowship together uh, in worshipping God because he is worthy of our praise. So we can raise our hands, lift our voices and just let his spirit surround us and unite us wherever we are. Let's sing together.
So today we are going to be looking at Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 7, it talks about the king, Melchizedek. Now this person, the story of him and Abraham goes right back to the book of Genesis, right back to the beginning. So just so that we can look into what that story was about, we're going to read Genesis uh, 14, verses 14 to 24. So when Abraham heard that his nephew had been taken prisoner, he lined up his servants and all of them, born in his household, there were 318 of them. And he chased after the captors all the way to Dan. Now Abraham and his men split into small groups and attacked by night. They chased them as far as Hobah, the north of Damascus. They recovered all of their things, along with their nephew Lot and his possessions, including the women and the people. After Abram returned from defeating the king and his allied kings, the king of Sodom came out to greet him in the valley of Seva, the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the high God and blessed him. Blessed be Abraham by the high God, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be the high God who handed your enemies over to you. Abraham gave him a tenth of all the plunder. So that is the story of King Melchizedek. And it says in Hebrews at chapter 7 that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, a priest of the highest God. He met Abraham and blessed him. And so Abraham gave him a tenth of all his spoils. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Salem means peace. So he is also the king of peace. Melchizedek towers out of the past without record of family ties, no account of beginning and end. And in this way, he is like the Son of God, one huge priestly presence dominating the landscape. So in a sense, this story right back in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis points to something else. And in Hebrews, Whoever wrote Hebrews, in a sense, was pointing us to something great. In history, Abraham was a great person in, in the Jewish history. But as you read through Hebrews, it seems like it's pointing to something else, something greater. So our activity today, uh, for the older kids... Uh, we're going to be thinking about things that are really great, that are really big. And there are some questions there for you to find out what those answers are. Mm -hmm. Can you find those answers? And for the little ones, there are also some pictures for you to try and figure out which one's the biggest, which one's the tallest, which one's the longest. So hopefully you can have fun while you're doing that. And as we do that, we are going to be thinking later on about those things that are greater. Uh, the older ones can look at words in the Bible that point towards Jesus as that thing that is greater. And we're also going to be thinking about how we can put our trust in him. And so now we are going to sing the song, Trust the Lord.
world is about to be like Jesus every day, to be like Jesus every day. Sing and shout and show the friends what it's about, to be like Jesus every day, to be like Jesus every day. Sing and shout and show the friends what it's about, to be like Jesus every day, to be like Jesus every day. Trust the Lord with all your heart. So now we are going to, to continue reading through Hebrews 7. And we finished off by saying that Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Since he had no father or mother without genealogy or without beginning or end of life, he resembled the son of God and he remained a priest forever. So just think how great he was that even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires that the descendants of Levi, who became priests, to collect a tenth from the people, from their fellow Israelites, even though they were all descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descendants from Levi, and yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without the doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but on the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, pay the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in his body. Now, if perfection had been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Abraham, Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from the tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. In regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever 
in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. A better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it is, with not, it is not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death, prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of, the, of other people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. And now as Louise comes to speak, Father, I pray that you will just bless her, that you would have your spirit rest on her and guide her thoughts and her words and, and help her to speak what you would want us to hear from this passage. And I pray for all of us as well, um, that you will just meet us wherever we are and your spirit will help us to hear, to understand and to really learn from this passage. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, good morning to you and thanks um, Jorinda for leading us so lovely so far this morning. Um, my name is Louise and I'm part of the leadership here at Portswood together with Andrew, Alice and Peter and it is my joy to be looking at chapter 7 of Hebrews with us this morning. The title I want to be looking at is Jesus is who you need. Now, I was in church last week and I was chatting to some folks who were telling me about how they were trying to buy a house but um, and look really good, really shiny, but when the survey came back, there were some serious problems in this house. The builder had obviously gone for some very quick fix solutions, but actually he hadn't really done the long-term work that really needed doing. It can be quite tempting for us, can't it, to go for quick fix solutions, and sometimes they are right if we don't have for example, um, the time to do something or the money or even the willpower at that moment, then a temporary fix will work, but we know that ultimately we need something permanent. If we go to the dentist in an emergency, for example, we get temporary filling. We never expect to keep that long term. We want to get something permanent. Same with if our car breaks down and the tire's flat. We might have one of those clever things that fix it and pump it up and seal it, but ultimately, that's not what we're going to be driving on. We're going to need to replace it. Now, in the same way, if we don't feel quite right in ourselves, we can also go for quick fix solutions. Uh, for example, if we're just feeling a little bit off, we might think, oh, maybe a night out would help, or seeing others, or a holiday, or maybe buying something, or maybe I just need to take up a new hobby, or maybe watch some TV, or play some Xbox. And at the time, it might enable us to get through that tough time. And we all know that at really tough times, we often do go to some of these things to get us by. But we also know that they're a temporary fix. They're not really what's actually needed. What we need is something much more permanent. 
Um, and often in those situations, although those things can be helpful, they're just covering over stuff. In the spiritual realms, our hearts, our soul, the inner being of who we are also needs not a temporary fix, but something really permanent. In fact, not a something, but a someone. Sometimes in life, we might find ourselves fortunate enough to experience some exceptional moments of peace, joy, and contentment. And these are really meant to, I think, awaken us to a need in us for something, someone more. In today's passage, we're going to see how the Jewish people who had entered an agreement with God, which was only ever meant to be temporary, got maybe a little bit too attached to it. This agreement was a kind of quick fix but ultimately it was never what their souls needed. It was only ever a model or an example of what God was going to do. It was a signpost towards what was really needed. Something better, as we've seen already this morning, something permanent. So let's get started. And the writer is going to talk in this passage about a better and permanent pre priest priesthood. So let's look briefly at three points he makes this morning. The three points he wants to tell us about this better and permanent priesthood. Firstly, he wants to say that this was always God's plan. God always has a plan. Secondly, he wants to say that this priesthood this priest, Jesus, is more powerful. And thirdly, he wants to say, this priest, singular, will never, ever fail you. So we're gonna start first with, this was always God's plan. Sometimes you hear people say, it was always our plan to, or it's always been the plan. I wonder if you've got a plan, a long-term plan. Some people are really good at that, aren't they? I'm not so good at it. But along the way, you kind of make do and mend, don't you? For example, you might find some very wealthy people say, it was always our plan to move to the country, but like they've lived in the city to make money in order to do it. Or you might hear an author say, it was always my plan to write a book, but until then they've been working in retail or in the entertainment industry because they needed to get by. It was always the plan. In Hebrews, we see the writer saying, it was always the plan, always God's plan. A thousand years earlier, you'll remember, or you may not know, that these people, the Hebrews, the Jews, who were reading this letter, their ancestors entered into an agreement with God, called as a covenant, a covenantal agreement, like a legally binding agreement. And the agreement said, you do this and I'll do this. The people swore on their whole hearts that they would keep their side of the deal. They would obey what God asked them to do. They would follow his ways. And they fully expected that they would be able to. But we see that in the system, it already allowed for mistakes. It already allowed for people not following God, both willfully and unwillfully unwillful that's a great word it already included a way for them to say sorry to be forgiven to be restored back into that relationship with god yahweh and others but it could never do what was really needed remember what we thought about in the beginning about how it's just temporary fixes when you have cancer and not that i have but the dreadful and awful moment. You know that you don't need some medicine that's just going to be a temporary fix. You need something that's going to completely eradicate it from your body. And spiritually, we need something really similar that will eradicate it, what's gone wrong, that will lead us to God, not away from God. What is needed in our souls is a healing that really we can get any other way than through God and through Jesus. Now, the law that came in in that agreement 
outlined the ways that people should behave. This is how God intended them to behave. This is the way he wired them originally, uh, to be good and kind and trustworthy and authentic and faithful, but they could never really do it. They needed something bigger to truly restore them, to keep them in that relationship of trust with God. And because of this, they were left in this sort of yo-yo situation where they went back and forth. Someone continually got something wrong, they needed to repent and come back to God. Got something wrong, repent and come back to God. It was only like a temporary solution, but they constantly went through the motions of this again and again, knowing that ultimately it wasn't really ever going to get to the heart of the matter. They needed something permanent. And so the writer says this by saying, I know God gave these laws, but it was only temporary. He had a bigger plan. And you can see that in verse 11. He says, If what we need was possible through these laws and rituals, we do. Why was there always another priest to come, a different one, not in these traditions? Why, he says, did David a thousand years previous write in a prophetic poem, look forward to a day when a priest would come in the order of a man named Melchizedek? Try saying that fast three times. Look at verse 17. Why, why was there someone else to come? You've probably heard of the Apple CEO, Steve Jobs, but you may not have heard of Mike Makula. He was the guy that sort of took a liking to Steve and acted as a mentor and promoted him. And today, by some, he's cited really as the reason for Apple's success. The writers of the Hebrews has been leading us gently to this guy called Melchizedek for several chapters now. You'd be forgiven for not knowing about him. He's really obscure. He's probably someone you'd miss. He seems like a minor character next to Abraham. But the writer of Hebrews here shows how this character was important in their history. And he was a key model or type of Christ or type of priest to come. Verse three, he uses the word resembling. And over the next couple of chapters, he'll kind of repeat this idea using the word copy or shadow of something to come. He says, this priest here, Melchizedek, might seem really unimportant, less than the one you know and love, but actually he was better. And how do I know that? Because even Abraham, the one who became the father of us all, including the priests, was blessed by him and honored him giving him a tenth of his goods. In doing this, Abraham holds him higher and more important, and so we should too. The question that led to this sort of straddling of the believers in, that he's writing to in the book of the Hebrews, they're sort of straddling Christianity and Judaism, and they're not quite sure what to do. The current system that they've grown up in, of course, is a priesthood descended from Levi. If you want to be a priest, you have to be descended from Levi. If you want to be a king, you come from Judah. And he says, I know that you know that Jesus was in the line of Judah and that for that you accept him as king, Messiah. But he's more, he's also priest. So how can this be? And he says, well, He can be that because he's not of the line of Levi. He's in the order of Melchizedek, this guy here, who was both a priest and a king. You know, he says the former regulations, the stuff that you've been doing has been set aside because it was weak and useless. 
and you can almost imagine them going, what? Are you mad, weak and useless? We've been using this for years. And then he comes on to point two, the priesthood was more powerful. You know, the permanent solution to a problem is always more powerful. For example, um, we've got bindweed in our garden um, and I can pull them out as much as I like, but they'll always come back until I remove the roots. In Hebrews chapter four, um, chapter 10, verse four, the writer writes, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This is where the writer is going. This system that used animal blood to make things right with God, it never worked. It was really pointing you to something else. And verse 27 of chapter seven, it says, this priest, he sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. The animals were never enough. How can an animal atone for a human being? But Jesus can. He's able to do what the old law, priesthood, sacrifices were unable to do because none of that was perfect. But Jesus is. It's a bit like if you want to fix your computer, if you put in an antiviral program that is corrupted in itself, you might solve one problem but you also now have another problem. And this is what we often do when we try to quick fix ourselves, when we exchange one problem for another. It's a bit like a drug addict replacing heroin for a script. It's better, but it's not the best. The best is completely free. And as Christians, we've learned coping mechanisms in life. Don't get me wrong, there are great steps to freedom, but we're not really free unless Jesus sets us free. They just get us through the day. And we've all got our own addictions. Listen to what Jesus says about our addiction to sin. He says, very truly I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Look back in verse 26 of chapter seven. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He's saying he's different from us. He's not corrupted in any way. He's never done anything wrong. He's the picture of the original design. And unlike all the priests before him and all the sacrifices that have been made, he and he alone has actually fixed it once and for all. He's done the job perfectly and he's brought us into a right relationship with God. It's him that we need to be close to, that intimacy with love himself. And it's there that we start to be free. And this system will never end. There's nothing temporary about it. It doesn't depend on us. It's not about what we do, but it's about who he is and what he's done. And he lives forever. He will never fail, never cease to exist. There will never be a day that is over. It's back to us to clean up our mess. Verse 23 says, Now here, now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he is a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. It says here, he's able to save completely. And I want you to think about that complete word. It means holy for all time, absolutely, to the end, to the utmost, perfectly. There is nothing left for you or I to do to restore this relationship. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And when we're finished trying to meet our needs, our deepest needs with temporary things, we turn to Jesus who really meets our true needs. He is the one that brings wholeness and completeness. And I'm sure by now you're thinking, but yeah, Lou, I'm a Christian, but I don't feel very perfect. And sometimes I don't really feel like my needs 
they're sort of I don't feel very whole I don't I still feel broken and I look at the world and I, I don't necessarily see Jesus reigning well that is exactly where the Hebrews were <laughs> they didn't see it they saw persecution and alienation from the community they saw injustice they still lived with sin and heartache and pain and loss just like us and they were really tempted because of that to return to their old way of doing life you know like ours when things are tough we often go to the wrong places to receive comfort when we uh, feel frustrated we can get really angry and hurt with others we can hurt them we can seek to deal with our negative worries by just trying to block it out fill our minds with tv or computer games we can try and lift our mood when we're feeling down by food or sex or alcohol when we run we can run to unhelpful relationships again and again to feel emptiness but we run back and back and back and we'll never ever get what we truly need what we truly need is Jesus we were created for a relationship with him and so when we run to other places we run away from what we need and it can be hard can't it at the moment we're not in the promised land as the Jews would say we're not there yet God hasn't restored all things Jesus will return he will restore it all but in the meantime the writer here says throughout the Hebrews don't drift fix your eyes on him be careful make every effort hold firmly to the faith and how back in chapter 4 again verse 16 approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need we are living in the now and the not yet it's a tension isn't it the worlds the old and the new go alongside each other the kingdom of god is near and yet we are still here all oh, that rhymes <laughs> you know but jesus is able it says to save us and not just save future tense but this is a present tense word it's the saving he has not only saved us on the cross, will save us in the kingdom when he comes again, but he is saving us right now. We're in the process of being restored and that is not easy. Life is hard, but we have a high priest who will never leave his post. He loves us. He's done everything possible to remove barriers between us and the Father. Through him, we have access to God because Jesus lives forever. He permanently intercedes on our behalf. He's a permanent priest there, rooting for us, representing us, pleading for us, praying for us. He is there. Verse 25, let's read it. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So today, we say the same message we've said every week, don't give up. Today is always the day we can come back to the throne of grace and mercy. Today is the day we can go to our Father for help. Today is the day we can know Jesus. Today is the day we know that he hasn't written off. There is always hope. There will never be a time when he said he's had enough of you your failures are too great in fact the more you fail the more grace he has romans chapter 5 verse 20 says but where sin increased grace increased all the more it's a bit like when you have a child and you you're expecting the second one and you think how can i possibly love the second one anymore i love this one so much and then the second one comes and you feel this overwhelming love. Love just grows and grows and grows 
And that's a bit like God's love for us. No matter what we do, wherever we go, his love for us remains and he's longing for us to come for him, to him, that we might receive grace. This week, when we're faced with choices, we need to remember that he is who we need. We need to remember that in the everyday, when we think at the beginning of the day, how will I do today? Today is so hard. Jesus is who we need. When we've totally lost the plot and we think, what can I do to come back from this? Jesus is who we need. When we're struggling in a meeting at work and we think, how on earth can I bring this round? Jesus is who we need. Paul wrote to the Philippian church. He really prayed that they grasp the love of God for them. That was his prayer, that they would grasp how much God loved them. And he wrote in Philippians chapter one, verse six, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And perhaps you need to hear that today. Maybe that verse is for you. If you haven't started this relationship yet with Jesus, and I say started because it is a journey, it isn't always easy, but Jesus is who you need. You know, sometimes you post on social media, don't you? Something like, I need someone to fix a tap. Can anyone recommend a plumber? And people come back with people and they say, oh, you know, so-and-so is who you need. Well, if you need someone to make you whole again, Jesus is who you need. He is waiting, arms wide. Nothing is stopping you. Will you open yourself to a relationship with him today? And if you wanna do that this morning, you don't need to do anything fancy. You just need to be honest. Just talk to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you. Tell him what you're sorry for. Tell him what's grieving you. Tell him what's upsetting you. Confess your part in it all. Thank him for his death on the cross for you. Thank you that he he is your priest forever and your king. And ask him to come and help you. And he does that through his Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of God who comes and lives in us and helps us with that process of being made whole. And so you can simply say, Jesus, send your Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit to me today bless you. That's it from me. Amen. There is a day that all creation's waiting for. A day of freedom and liberation for the earth And on that day the Lord will come to meet his bride And when we see him in an instant we'll be changed
so much for that song. You know, I absolutely love it. Just thinking about what awaits those who follow Jesus. Freedom, liberation, all the hurt and pain will cease and that we can be with him forever. But even in the here and now, though things are difficult, though there is pain and suffering, we have a high priest that truly meets our needs. As we were looking at earlier in Hebrews 7, he is holy, blameless, pure, set apart and exalted above the heavens. So let us praise our God together in prayer and lift up each other in prayer as well. Father, we thank you that you are holy, that you are blameless, that you are poor, pure, and that you who had no sin, offered yourself for us. You offered yourself to take away all of our sins, both past, present, and future. And we thank you that you have blessed us with such an opportunity. We thank you that we can come before you and lay down all of our burdens, all of our wrongs, and that you take them away. We thank you for all of the the truths that was in that song, that you can take away all of our, our pain and our hurt, and that in the end, we will be with you forever. That is such a glorious thing to remember, that even though we go through the difficulties now, that you are with us, that you are a high priest who cares, who understands, who knows the difficulties that we go through and that you go through them with us. And Father, we also want to lift up those in our prayer directory for today. We've got Tim and Emily, Steve and Tom and Laura. And I pray that you'd be with each of these people, even now and through the weeks to come, Father, that you will be with them in all of their ups and downs, um, that you would bless them in all that they're doing and that you would give them the love and support that they need in whatever is going on in their lives at the moment. We just thank you for each one in our fellowship today. And now if we've shared some prayers with each other, we'd like to just take a moment to just pray for each other in our own quiet time now.
We've now come to the end of the service and I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. We're praying that you were blessed and encouraged by the time spent together. And it's really important to just stay connected and, you know, keep sharing those stories, those prayer requests with each other so we can keep each other in prayer. There won't be a a Zoom session after church today, but some of us are going to the park. So if you've signed up for that, uh, you should know which location you're going to. And just let's join together and continue that fellowship. If you're not in a house group um, and you'd like to meet in one uh, because they meet regularly online, then feel free to email Portswood, sorry, the Portswood Church email address, which is admin at portswood.org.uk. Thank you again for joining us. Take care and see you soon. Yeah.